Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Alan Stein, Jr., when I was a Division I All-American athlete, I was hyper-focused and I was able to take consistent action that allowed me to be one of the best in the country at what I did. Well, for years after I was done competing, I just struggled to stay focused on my goals day in and day out. I was easily distracted, so I wasn't able to stay consistent, the kind of consistency that you need to have to achieve goals that are meaningful to you. It was discouraging for me. I felt like I was just slipping kind of into mediocrity. Then after interviewing some of the highest performers in the world, Olympians, CEOs, billionaires, best-selling authors, I discovered how they do it. I discovered 18 powerful and sometimes weird tactics that they use to stay focused at work, focused on the right things while also living a balanced life. And if you start using probably just three of these today, you're going to get more done in the next eight hours. I promise. This is not tomorrow, not next week. These will work today. I guarantee it. It's like magic, but they're real world solutions to it. People like you and me want the ability to stay focused, avoid distraction and be consistent. I use at least four of them every day and have used all of them at some point. And now I'm able to stay focused while I'm at work and get probably 50 to a hundred percent more done each day. I'm more present when I'm home with my wife and four kids. And the result is I have a stronger relationship with my family And I'm still able to achieve incredible goals like being selected to give a TEDx talk at one of the biggest TED events in the world, like launching a podcast and talking to A-list guests and running a half marathon, all of this while having a full-time job that includes frequent travel, working nights and weekends and all that good stuff. So you're going to find solutions on this list that are going to surprise you. Grab your copy of the 18 Tactics to Staying Focused at Work. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash focus. That's jimharshawjr.com slash focus. Alan is a performance coach and consultant, speaker, and author. He spent 15 years working with the highest performing basketball players on the planet Alan delivers high-energy keynotes and interactive workshops to improve performance, cohesion, and accountability. He inspires and empowers everyone he works with to take immediate action and to improve mindset, habits, and productivity. In other words, Alan teaches you how to utilize the same strategies in business that elite athletes use to perform at a world-class level. His book, Raise Your Game, published in January 2019. And for the listener, as always, if you don't have time to listen to this whole episode or if you hear something you really like but you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you get your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jim. I've been looking forward to this for a while, my friend. It's great to connect. Yeah, likewise. You know, and this is such a perfect match. Um, You know, I talk so much about my life as an athlete uh, and bring on a lot of athletes or or former athletes onto the show. And we talk about those similar skills and traits and mindsets and habits and routines and rituals that elite performers have in whether they're athletes or in business or performance or or whatever the case might be. um, It's just all so relevant. And um, and it just, uh, it's so much easier to see it in sports and then you can go, okay, how, how do I now implement that into my, into my business life, into my personal life, et cetera. So um, this is a, this is a, a perfect fit, Alan. So why don't you do this? Start out with telling us a little bit about your background, maybe a 30,000 foot view of kind of where you grew up and, and how you got from there to here. Sure. Uh, I grew up uh, in a suburb of the Washington DC area and basketball was my first identifiable passion. I remember falling in love with the game at, at five or six years old and, and basketball has been a major uh, pillar of my life ever since. And I, I'm just about to turn 43. So it's been a staple in my life, um, for my entire life. And 
Uh, I remember as a kid that I was always incredibly active. Um, I did every sport and activity under the sun from skateboarding and BMX biking to martial arts to your more conventional sports like basketball, baseball, and so forth. Uh, but despite trying all of those, I always came back to basketball. There was something about basketball that I always gravitated towards. And I think one of those things was that basketball is a sport that you can work on individually. You can work on the skills of the game and you really don't need anybody else. I mean, if you have a hoop and a ball, you can work on most of the major skills, uh, whereas other sports, not so much. You know, it's, it's hard to get better at soccer or baseball or football unless you have someone to throw with or catch with or play with. Uh, so I like that component, but then I loved being able to take everything that, that I could work on, you know, in my driveway, uh, and then apply that to others and make the team better and, and take, you know, my ability to handle the ball and, and shoot the ball at a higher clip and be able to use that to make the team more successful. And I think that was one of many reasons that I always gravitated towards basketball. And, uh, I was able to play in college. I played at Elon down in North Carolina, uh, and then, I mean, the writing was on the wall that when college was over, uh, my playing days were over, but I knew that I wanted to be in the, you know, involved in the game. And, uh, at that point I'd started to develop an equal affinity for performance training, strength and conditioning and improving athleticism. Uh, so when I graduated college in 1998, uh, I became a basketball performance coach and I did that for almost 20 years. I had some remarkable experiences and, uh, then a couple of years ago decided to take on a new professional challenge and take everything I had learned and observed uh, in those 20 years from some of the best players and coaches in the world and retarget uh, that to the business world and, and show businesses you know, how to use the same stuff that I had learned through the game uh, to make their businesses uh, more successful. So let's, let's start from there. Um, you know, there's a lot of books out there on the market. Why did you write your book? I mean, what's different uh, about Raise Your Game and, and what you know, what can the listener or the, the you know, prospective buyer uh, plan to learn if they read your book? Well, I was very fortunate in those 20 years that, that I was able to see the world's best players from two very distinct vantage points. Uh, one, I was able to work at two schools here in the Washington, D.C. area that combined uh, have put dozens of players in the NBA. Uh, I worked at Montrose Christian for seven years, uh, which is where Kevin Durant graduated from high school, and then I worked at DeMatha Catholic High School, uh, which is where Victor Oladipo and Markel Fultz and a whole host of other guys uh, uh, played. So I got to see uh, several NBA players when they were 13, 14, 15 years old. I got to see them before they became the great players that they are today. Then, because of my work at those two schools, both of which were Nike elite schools, uh, I got to work Nike's Summer Skills Academy series for almost a decade. And I got to work events for LeBron James and Kobe Bryant and Steve Nash and, and Steph Curry and Chris Paul. Uh, so I got to be a fly on the wall and observe great players after they had already become great players. So I've gotten to see kind of the before and the after of what makes players great. And uh, I realized that, you know, I'm very fortunate to have been able to have those perspectives and that that most people you know, haven't had those opportunities. So the, the main impetus for writing the book was to be able to, to take a peek behind the curtain and share what these great players do during the unseen hours. You know, I, I felt that's my responsibility that I was afforded opportunities to see this stuff. And, and I've always believed that as a coach, you know, a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. You know, I feel like it's my duty and my obligation to take everything that I learned and now share it with others. And, and I wrote the book very distinctly so that it was certainly, aimed at folks in the business world. That was the original target, but I also wrote it in a way that it would be of huge value uh, to coaches, uh, to players, to folks that are still in the sports world. So what, what do you see as the most common sort of themes between elite performers in sports and elite performers in business? And I know that's a big, broad question. I know you wrote an entire book about it, but I mean, what are some of those things? You know, when you see a young Kevin Durant or you see a, a you know a, a professional athlete Steph Curry, what are the what are the similarities you see between those guys and elite performers in business and in the real world? Well, the first is kind of the foundation to which the entire book is built, and that's the best never get bored with the basics that that they're yeah, they're willing beautiful. to live in and stick with 
the fundamentals, which obviously in the game of basketball is footwork, uh, is shooting mechanics, is is passing and ball handling. Uh, but in business, it's the same thing. You know, uh, we're enamored with LeBron James, but we're also equally in Amber with, you know, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and a guy like that still continues to stick to the basics of how to run a successful business. So never getting bored with the basics um, is definitely something that separates elite performers from everybody else because we live in a society that that encourages us to skip steps, that encourages us to circumvent the process that pretty much begs us and pushes us to constantly chase what's new and what's flashy and what's sexy and to ignore what's basic. Uh, but elite performers in any walk of life know that the basics work. They always have and they always will. And, and it, takes, it takes humility to acknowledge that you still need the basics after you've been an NBA all-star for 15 years, you know, after you've made tens of millions of dollars to still stick with those basics takes a tremendous amount of humility. Uh, but, but again, that's a quality of, of elite performers. And it's interesting. First of all, I love that point. It is as true as anything you'll ever hear on this podcast that those basics and the fundamentals are that that's everything, right? You, you look at elite performers and they're so good at the base. I mean, they, they don't have some special secret sauce, right? We are, we are always looking for that, you know, and we're always looking for what's that one thing, you know, what's that thing that, that I don't even know that magic that I don't know. And then, and then, you know, you talk to elite performers and, and you go, Oh, well, I know that I guess I'm not doing it consistently. Right. So many of my clients and, and prospective clients and people I talk to, they know that consistency is a challenge, right? And because because we yeah. know it's those it's those fundamental things that, that we need to do, and and those are boring a lot of times. But it's you know I look back at my life, and when I finally got on the podium at the national wrestling championships, it was it was the basics. It wasn't some fancy flashy move, right? It was the basics. But but we're wooed by these get rich quick stories. We're wooed by you know people hitting the lottery. We're wooed by these few stories of people who you know, became elite at whatever it was, whether it's business or sports quickly or overnight or without much work. And there are a few of those stories out there. There's very few, but by and large, when you, when you hear the stories about the Steph Curry's and the Kevin Durant's and other elite performers, you go, you don't realize when you, when, when you pull back the curtain, Oh my goodness, the amount of work, the amount of dedication, the amount of commitment, the amount of consistency, the amount of focus on the fundamentals is beyond what most people would ever even dream of. Is that, is that what you found? Oh, absolutely. And, and you just said, I mean, so many insightful points there. Uh, one is we do have part of that humility is acknowledging that the basics usually are boring. They're mundane, they're monotonous. And that's why it's so hard to fall in love with them to live there. Uh, but it's also important to realize that that you have to look at those as kind of the foundation to which the rest of the house is built. Uh, it, it clearly, if you watch LeBron James or Kevin Durant or Steph Curry, you know they're not only doing basic moves during the game, but the basics and the fundamentals have provided the foundation that allow them to level up to do those more advanced sure. moves. And that's where uh, younger players make the mistake, you know. And I know I did when I was a kid. You know, you in my day, you know, you watch Michael Jordan do something on TV that was magical, and you run out to your front yard and you try to emulate that. Right. But you're cheating the process because right. you don't realize what you just said so perfectly was that he spent years and years and years in empty gyms by himself mastering the fundamentals that led to the point where he could make a move like that. And if you try to just skip steps and go right to that move, you're cheating the process. And in this case, you're cheating the game. And, you know, my really good friend, Jay Billis uh, of ESPN, who wrote the forward to the book, uh, he always says that the only way to the top of any ladder is rung by rung. You have to touch every step. There's no other way to the top. You have to touch every step. Now, as many people have learned the hard way, you can fall all the way to the bottom with one misstep, but you have to touch every rung on the way up. And that's, yeah. that again goes back to that respect of the process and knowing that, yes, this might not be the sexiest or most glamorous stuff, but I have to do it if I want to be able to do that, that other stuff. And, and the other point, you know, I love that you're such an advocate of consistency because if you do the little things consistently, they add up to big things. So I'm not saying that, that, that Kevin Durant needs to work on his footwork for three hours a day. He just needs to do it for 15, 20 minutes a day. But he yeah. does it every 
single day. And he's done that since he was, you know, a teenager. So that's how it all, it's the cumulative effect. Uh, it's that compound interest that's building. So, uh, that's the other thing is if, if you can have the maturity to say, look, I don't need to do the basics for five hours a day. I just need to do them consistently for dedicated and purposeful and intentional time every day. And it will start to add up. And for the listener, the takeaway here is, is what is that basic thing? What is that fundamental that you know that you need to do? The thing you've got to grind out every day. You know, if you're in sales, that's picking up the phone, maybe, right? You know what it is. Uh, well, I, if, I do. In, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, here's, here's what I found, because I've, I've tried to reverse engineer this and figure this out. And I found that whether it's sales or it's leadership, that when you really start brushing away everything else, one of the most fundamental skills that all of us need to continue to improve, uh, including me, because I just interrupted you, is the ability <laughs> to listen, to, to actively listen. Listen. In fact, I mean, you brought up sales. You know, I, I've been mentored by some world class professional, you know, uh, sales folks, and they'll be the first to tell you that telling is not selling. That if you really yeah. want to sell anything, whether it's a service or a product, you have to really get to know the issue that your your prospect is having, and you need to be able to solve that. And the only way you'll ever be able to do that is to listen. And the best coaches and the best leaders in business and in sport that I've ever been around became world-class active listeners because they practiced it. And, and like any fundamental, you'll only get better with purposeful practice. And it's something that, you know, regardless of who's listening to this show right now, if you improve your ability to actively listen, you will improve every relationship in your life immediately. It doesn't matter if it's with your spouse, your children, your coworkers, or your clients, you will improve it immediately if you improve the skill of active listening. And, and for me, it's been something I've been incredibly focused on for the last few years to improve uh, because I was a really poor listener several years ago and, and didn't really have the self-awareness to even realize I was a poor listener. Uh, and once I realized that, I've been uh, steadily trying to improve that skill set. And while I'm not world-class yet, I'm better today than I was a year ago. And if you and I reunite a year from now, I can guarantee you I'll be better then. Well, I hope we do. Um, so, Alan... How do we take so active listening? I love this, right? So this is this is again, really. I mean, it's a this is a fundamental. This is probably not something that 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 most listeners have never heard before, right? But it's it's about listening. I love you know telling is not selling, right? And and this goes for whether you're in sales, whether you're in leadership, whether you're talking about parenting, right? If you're trying to sell your kids mm -hmm. something, you got to listen, right? You got to listen <laughs> and hear what the, where they're coming from, so you can address it properly. Um, and just sort of, you know, recognizing body language, that whole thing. But how do I'm going to ask you a question, Alan, it may not have an answer, but I, I love sort of exploring this. How do you take something like this and make sure you do it? Right? So because because the listener is listening to this podcast right now, and they're driving or they're on the treadmill or, or wherever they're at on their commute. And that's going to end the podcast is going to go off and then they go into their office or they go home and, and they step back into the real world. And and they're going to have a conversation, right, with a coworker, with a spouse, with a friend. And how do they make sure? Do you have any tactics to make sure that you're actually present, you're actually mindful, you're actually oh, in I, the moment? I, I do to become an active listener. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I try to be a practitioner with everything that I teach. And there's been two things that 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 I'll share that have been incredibly helpful for me. Uh, one, you know, these same uh, sales professionals that have mentored me talked about how important it is to. Uh, instead of just waiting for your turn to talk, which is what most people do, you know, while, while you're speaking, I'm simply formulating in my mind what I'm right. going to say, and I'm not really paying attention to what you're saying, is you make sure that you're fully listening. And, and the way that you can check yourself to do that is to make sure that you ask a follow-up insightful question. Uh, what, what they say is nine times out of 10, the best answer you can give is actually another question that that peels back the layers of the onions a, a little bit further and dives a little bit deeper. So the only way you can be prepared to ask an insightful question uh, is if you're listening. And, you know, when we go back to sales, just using that as an example, uh, a, a world-class sales professional doesn't convince anyone to buy anything. What they do is they ask the right questions and the prospect convinces themselves. If you ask the right questions and, and what you have actually solves their problem, which is the match that we're all looking for, if you ask them the right questions, they'll convince themselves to buy. Yeah. So asking insightful questions and, and using that 
as a tool has been helpful. But one of the most helpful tools for me uh, is what I call a list back. And what you do when there's an appropriate break in the conversation, and this can work personally or professionally, it can work. It works with my eight year old twin sons and six year old daughter, and it works with elite basketball players and business professionals. When there's an appropriate break in the conversation, you list back in their words what they just said. And this will do a couple of things. One, it will confirm accuracy. So I could say something to the effect of, uh, Jim, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Uh, you said A, B, and C. Is that right? And then that gives you a chance to affirm, to affirm what I just said is correct, or it gives you a chance to offer the correct information. If for any reason I'm, I'm incorrect and you can say, uh, no, Alan, uh, it's actually A, B, and D. But either way, I know that I have the correct information. But way more important than the, the correct information is I'm sending you a very powerful unconscious message. And that unconscious message is, I care. I value you. I care about what you have to say. You are important to me. Because right now, I'm investing my most valuable currency in the entire world, which is my attention in the present moment. And when I list back what you just said in your words, you unconsciously know that I had given you my full attention and unconsciously you know that I care. And that is a glue that bonds, whether again, it's spouse to spouse, parent to child, uh, colleague to colleague, or you know, salesperson to client or customer, you're telling them and showing them that you truly care. Care and, and those two tools, you know, they, they took a lot of reinforcement and and in the beginning, uh, it felt very robotic, uh, it felt very awkward, but often learning any new skill is same thing in basketball. Sure. You, you show a player a new move, and the first dozen times they do it, it, it feels very robotic and awkward. But if you do it enough time, then you start to have the the muscle memory to do it correctly. And it's the same thing with listening. Uh, you need the awareness to catch yourself when you're not listening and have some type of trigger to get you back to the present moment. Love that. And those are two really practical, really actionable things that, that you can do. I'm again talking to the listener here. Those are two, I mean, you know, the best answer is, a, is always another question. Uh, there's often at least another question. And then the second one is uh, the list back. So I love those. I mean, those are, those are concrete, real things that you can actually do after this podcast is over. These are habits that you can build into your life. And Alan, you have a, a great quote uh, you said, are the habits you have for today on par with the dreams that you have for tomorrow? And this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, up on the wall in the Penn State in massive letters on the Penn, in the Penn State football facility. Is that right? Yes, it is. That, I tell you what, and I didn't know that they were putting that up. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have any connection to Penn State. I didn't go there and, and certainly wasn't a football player. Uh, but someone had sent me that. They had saw it in a documentary and it, it just blew my mind. I mean, uh, yeah, that... Uh, I mean, really, that quote just comes down to everything that you and I have been talking about. You know, are the things that you're doing on a daily basis, are they in alignment with where it is that you're trying to go? Because if they're not, then something needs to change. You either need to change your habits or you need to change your dreams. And very few people will look you in the eye and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and lower my dreams. I don't want to shoot for the stars, which means mm -hmm. the only thing that you can change is your habits. You know, if, if you want to be an elite level basketball player, then you need to have elite level habits. You know, you need to carry yourself as if you are a champion well before you become one. That's the only way you will be able to become a champion is if you have those habits uh, ahead of time. You know, it's, 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 it's simple cause and effect. And, and to me, that's something that I have to remind myself of all of the time. You know, I, I have my dreams and my goals and my ambitions, whether they're to have a stronger connection with my children or to do something in business. And I have to constantly look back and ask myself, am I doing the things on a daily basis that will lead me to that result? I know that nothing will guarantee the result, but am I increasing my chances by what I do on a daily basis? And, you know, it's, I'm like anybody else, I'm, I'm fallible. And I have some days where I can say, yes, absolutely. I'm in alignment. And then I have some other days where I go, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I could have done better today. I, I need to, I need to tighten up my habits if I really and truly want to get where I'm trying to go. And for the listener, I'll challenge you right now. Just think about it. You know, this is, you know, I talk about a productive pause. And for the, for, uh, for those of you who've been listening for a long time, you know what this is, but the definition is a, of a productive pause is a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. Clarity of action and peace of mind. So I ask you this is to, you know, what are the, what are the habits that you're doing right now that are either holding you back 
or the habits that you're not doing that you know that you need to do, right? Is it planning your day in advance? Is it, you know, picking up the phone and making that phone call? Is it active listening? Is it getting back to the basics? So I challenge you to actually ask yourself that question and then take action on it, right? Put it on your to-do list or, or set a reminder on your phone to make sure that you actually, you actually do it and, and do things, the practical things that'll, that'll help you change those habits. Alan, what else from the book? So we've got Number one, I've got written down here is not getting bored with the basics. Uh, And the second one you mentioned is active listening. I mean, what are some of the other major takeaways that you've learned from elite athletes that are, that are, you know, can be directly transitioned into business and otherwise? Well, uh, the next one is kind of an offshoot of the active listening because in order to actively listen, you have to be in the present moment. And that's, it's another foundational principle of the book is to what I call live present. And when I was in the basketball space, we would try to get our players play present. A short definition of live present. Uh, I've heard Nick Saban of Alabama say it, and I've heard Oprah say it. So I don't know who the originator is, but I, I, I absolutely love it. And it's simply to be where your feet are, you know, wherever your feet are, make sure your head and your heart are there as well. And while that may sound obvious in this digitally distracted world we live in, I'm I'm sure it's pretty easy for your listeners to picture someone staring at their phone uh, when they're not present in in where they are physically. I mean, think about it. Uh, How many times uh, are you with your kids, but you're not really with your kids. You're you're focused on your phone, you know, and, and, you know, so you have to learn to be where your feet are, but to expand on that, um, there's actually three pillars of living present. One is you focus on the next play. Two is you focus on what you have control over. And three, we've already touched on a little bit is you focus on the process and, and I'll unpack each of those very quickly. Uh, Please. first is you focus on the next play. Uh, the next play is the only one that matters because it's the only one you can have an effect on. You can't do anything about the play that just happened. So if a basketball player, you know, misses a wide open layup or turns the ball over or, or drives to the basket and thinks they got fouled, but the ref didn't call it, that play is now over and you have a choice to make, whether it's focus on the next play or, or pout about the one that just happened. And an elite level player will say, Oh, I missed that shot. I have a short term memory and I'm going to sprint back on defense. Um, whereas a novice player gets in their feelings, pouts, gets discouraged, and, and jogs back on defense. And what they end up doing is they turn one mistake into multiple mistakes by not being in the present moment and follow, you know, focusing on the next play. And for uh, the listener, tr- just, just that, that's, that's real life too, right? You're going to make a mistake. You're oh, going to blow a sale. You're going to blow a call. You're going to have a bad conversation with your boss. You're going to, this is all relevant stuff. You got to move on. Yeah. And if, and, and, and that's the thing, if you're a world-class sales professional and your, your sales call doesn't go well, you're not going to let that previous performance affect the next performance. You're going to gather feedback from it. You're going to learn, you know, what maybe was in your control that you could have done differently. And then you're going to wipe the slate clean and you move on to the next. You know, that's one of the things that makes someone like Stephen Curry so remarkable is he can miss seven shots in a row and he'll shoot the eighth one as if he made the the previous seven. Yeah. He yeah. never lets previous misses affect his next attempt. And that is much easier said than done. And I want to point something out to the listener real quick is it's not that Steph Curry doesn't have emotion, right? It sucks for him. He's bombed. He's like, he's fr- he can get frustrated, but you've got to, you've got to push that aside and move past it. Right. It's not that they have, they are robots that don't have any care or feeling. No, they do. They actually care as much or more, but they're able to let it go. They're able to mechanically say, okay, I know that the best next thing for me to do is take this next shot with the confidence that I made those last seven. Yes, exactly. You said that perfectly. And that's because they know that they can't do anything about the previous seven misses. So, so any, any time or, or mental energy that's wasted on something that can't be changed is not a very good investment. So they focus on the next one and you know, it doesn't happen because it's so good, but I mean, he could miss 20 shots in a row and he would still for the ball if the game was tied and there were two seconds left because he always believes that the next shot is going in. And, and, and again, we could take that to conversations with our children. We can take that to sales. We can take that to leadership and business. I mean, any of these things, no matter what happens, you have to be prepared to quickly move to the next play. And that is not to condone sloppy play or lackadaisical effort. No, you're, you need to give the best effort with the best focus you have, but many times things won't go to your liking. And the sooner you can move to the next thing, the better you'll be. 
And that leads into your second one, which is focus on what you can control. Tell us about that. Yes, which, which there's only two things in this world that we, we have 100% control over 100% of the time, and that's our effort and our attitude. You know, there's other things within our sphere of influence and, and we have a huge, you know, influence over preparation and we have huge influence over enthusiasm. Uh, but those are really just kind of, you know, combinations of effort and attitude. Effort is always a choice. And what I find funny is when you ask most people is working hard a choice? Uh, yeah, they say absolutely. And they nod their head in agreement. But then that means by default, not working hard is also a choice. Yeah. You have to have the other side of the coin. And most people don't own that side. When you hold people accountable for not giving their best effort, most people will start to give you a litany of excuses. You know, I wasn't feeling well. I didn't get any sleep. I was hungry. I was this, I was that. And ultimately your effort is always a choice. And then same thing with attitude. I mean, this is something I say to my young kids all of the time, and it's medicine I have to continually take on a daily basis. We don't control the vast majority of things that happen around us and in the world, but we always control how we respond to those things. That is ours. And if we choose to respond in ways that move us forward and serve us, then we'll continue to up-level our performance. Uh, if we choose not to, then we'll start to regress and we'll go back. So no matter what happens, whether something really good happens or something really bad happens, you choose how to use that information or feedback, if you will. You choose whether to take the good and double down and make it better or take the bad and learn the lesson from it so that then you become better. But the, the choice on how we respond and that attitude is always ours. You know, clearly we don't control whether or not the sun is shining or it rains, but we control the attitude we have no matter what happens. And that leads right into the third one. Focus on the process, not the outcome. Yes. And we've pretty much touched on that. We need to focus on the little things that we need to do every day. You know, think about building a brick wall. Uh, don't think of the end wall. Think about laying each brick as perfectly as you can. And if you lay each brick with perfection and precision, the wall will take care of itself. And again, whatever your outcome goals are, whatever results you're looking for, uh, don't get married to those. Get married to the step-by-step -step process that will increase the chance of those outcomes happening in your favor. Alan, you've, you've, you by, by every measure are what we define as a successful person, right? But, you know, we know that you know, through this podcast that success takes a lot of struggle, a lot of failure, a lot of setback. Um, you are, uh, you know, by the time listeners, re you know, listening to this, a published author, um, you know, you've worked with the most elite performers on the planet, keynote speaker, you've had a lot of success in your life. Can you tell us about a time where you failed, a time where you failed and you felt that, that hopelessness or that self doubt that comes with failure and how you move through that? Absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, my second book could be I mean, it could, it could be the thickest book you've ever seen. And it would be the numerous failures that I've had because they've been plenty. And, and, and some of those I allowed, unfortunately, to kind of get me down uh, and others uh, I've become rather bulletproof and, and resilient towards. But the one that's probably had the biggest change in my life uh, was I'm very amicably divorced now. Uh, and I'm proud to say amicably because uh, my ex and I have worked hard uh, to develop a, a friendship and to be um, excellent co-parents to our children because that's something that's important to us. Um, but uh, going through a divorce or a failure, if you will, uh, was life-changing in a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, I don't, despite what the statistics are, which is half of people get divorced, no one gets married thinking they're going to get divorced. Everyone thinks they're getting married and, and will be married for life. That's why people do it. Uh, so that was, you know, I don't view it as a failure now looking back, but I absolutely did at the time. Uh, and uh, it shook me in a lot of different ways. But what I'm so thankful for was the divorce led me to go in and get some counseling and some therapy. Uh, and that therapist helped me uncover some things about myself that I didn't know and to really dig deep and, and really scrutinize and face a, a lot of fears and insecurities and worries uh, that I had. Uh, and really, I mean, it was some really tough internal work, uh, but she got me to raise my self-awareness and raise, um, you know, my emotional IQ uh, to a, a, an extreme high level. And that's helped me tremendously ever since. I'm a better father. I'm a better ex-husband. I'm a better author. I'm a better speaker. I'm a better coach. I'm just a better man today because that divorce, which was an epic failure, forced me to do some internal work, internal work that is, that is truly helped me and transformed me. So, uh, that, that low point, uh, has now bounced back and is a, a very high point. In life. And I want to 
to challenge the listener to think about, you know, think about the failure, the struggle in your life that you've gone through in the past or that you're going through right now and and realize that that there are great things that can come out of that, right? There are great things that, that you can do. There are things you can learn. And and you will never know in the moment, you will never know the the positives and the good things that can come out of it. But uh, but just, just challenge, challenge you to look back and, and see some of the failures or setbacks in your life in the past and say, okay, what, what good actually has come out of that? Why am I actually better from that now? So thank you for sharing that, Alan. Of course. And how about we wrap up with an action item or two? Um, what action item can the listener take, let's say in the next 24 to 48 hours to really start moving toward their goals? If you want to be an elite performer in anything that you do, you have to make sure that your bucket is full. Uh, I guarantee everybody makes sure their cell phone is charged up overnight. So we need to make sure that we charge ourselves. And what I I would like folks to do uh, is to make a list of the, the four or five things and I say things in air quotes, even though we're on an audio podcast, the four or five things that fill your bucket physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, you know, it might be taking a spin class or a yoga class. Uh, it might be taking the dog for a walk. Uh, it might be meditating or reading a book at a coffee shop. It might be firing up a hot bath and having a glass of red wine. It might be listening to classical music, whatever it is, find the things that really refill your bucket and charge your battery and come up with that list. And then I want you to make a list of what your, your normal morning and evening routine is. And I know that everybody listening to this has a standard morning and evening routine. The question is whether or not they designed it with intention and purpose yeah. or whether they've just fallen backwards into it. And then I want you to take what you do most mornings and evenings. And then I want to take the list of things that you know fill your bucket. And I want you to cross-reference those things. And I want to see if you are making time in the mornings and evenings for a little bit of me time to recharge your, your battery and refill your bucket because you have to, uh, if you want to be, uh, the parent that you're capable of the business owner that you're capable of, you know, even the basketball player that you're capable of, you have to make sure that your bucket is full. And, and, and unfortunately, especially folks in the business world and entrepreneurs, uh, they almost wear it as a badge of honor that they let themselves get so run down and they, they don't get the sleep that they need. They, they stop doing their workouts. Like they pour everything into their business, which I can understand the noble intentions behind, but you have to realize if you want that business to be the best that it's capable of, then you have to be the best that you're capable of. And you have to make sure that you're plugging yourself in and, and taking that me time is not being selfish. It's actually right. an act of selflessness because when you fill your bucket, then you can pour into others. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, for anybody who's gone through my coaching program or, or any of the listeners who have been around for a while, you've heard I talk about goals, having goals in your four areas of your life being relationships, self health and wealth. So that second piece, self is so important. That's growth. That's impact on the world. That's fun. Things that you want to do that are just fun or fulfilling for you. Um, extremely important. So thanks for the insight and advice. Um, Alan, it's, uh, it, it definitely resonates with everybody who's listening and certainly myself. Can you tell the listener where we can find you, find your books, uh, book and, uh, follow you, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. For anyone interested in the book, uh, it's available as a hard copy, an audio book and for Kindle, uh, and you can get it at raise your game book dot com or certainly search any major retailer uh, in stores or Amazon, what have you. Uh, and for anything else on me for the speaking and coaching and so forth, uh, you can just go to allensteinjr.com. Uh, and I'm also at Allenstein Jr. Uh, on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, all of the major social channels. And I love engaging with folks on there. So uh, if anyone listening, if any of this resonated with you, uh, please drop me a line on social. Uh, it would be great to connect and, and have some further dialogue. Excellent. Alan, thank you. And for the listener, of course, I'll have all those links and everything he just shared there in the action plan. If you go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Alan, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. 